So, what is Changa, for those of you who don't know? Um, it's essentially a smoking mixture containing the same or similar ingredients as ayahuasca. In most cases, this is, this is uh, made from crystal DMT, extracted from acacias or mimosa, which is then dissolved and soaked onto herbs that contain a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, such as Banisteria alpsis carpi, the ayahuasca vine, uh, Syrian rue, or even passion flower. In the brain, these harmless alkaloids from the MAOI herbs directly inhibit the enzyme that would normally very rapidly metabolize DMT. And this gives us a very unique pharmacological synergy between the tryptamine alkaloids and the harmless alkaloids. Uh, ratios of DMT to harmless are key to the intensity and duration of the Changer experience uh, and can vary from only a little bit of DMT to over 50%. Chang is preferred by a lot of people, uh, it gives a longer duration to the DMT experience, anywhere from say 10 to 40 minutes. Uh, many describe it as softer, gentler, and the peak breakthrough states that people speak of can be built up to gradually because of the presence of the harmless alkaloids. So the Chang experience can be made to last as long as you like, uh, simply by smoking gradually and slowly and staying in the space longer. Um, this can also reveal the, the very clear audible guidance of the ayahuasca vine present in the mix through a, a voice or, or teachings. Uh, Chang is a convenient form of visiting the ayahuasca space or, or staying in tune with teachings from the vine that you may have gotten ceremonies drinking the brew. And given the strictures of diet, fasting, and the expense and travel often involved with ayahuasca ceremonies becomes perfect for our modern society. So, some have called Chang'e the evolution of ayahuasca. Uh, the smoking of DMT, and even more so, Chang'e is an exclusively modern and largely Western practice. Um, and a key article entitled The Evolution of Ayahuasca states that Chang'e is quite possibly one of the most amazing innovations in the technology of the sacred in our lifetime. Author and researcher Graham St. John has examined Chang'e as a cultural phenomenon and notes the significance of the DIY nature of Chang'e especially so the context of its development through sites like the DMT Nexus and other underground research communities. In researching the religious dimensions of DMT, Des Tramachi showed how the DIY ethos of the entheogenic movement has fostered the idea of psychonauts as self-sufficient shamans, who no longer need the assistance of a guide or supplier, but perform acts of self-shamanizing. Des also points to the grassroots person-to-person -person sociality of the entheogenic community and how it organically grows by sharing visions as well as technical knowledge, negotiating consensus on important issues of safety and sanity, and bound together through shared intense experience. However, artist Daniel Morante notes that calling Changa an evolution of ayahuasca fails to acknowledge that Changa and ayahuasca are two very different cultural phenomena that arose and continue to arise in separate cultural contexts with different social and historical frameworks. In his thorough air experimentation with various ayahuasca analogues and admixtures, Jonathan Ott describes the ayahuasca effect, and this refers to any combination of DMT and MAOIs. Uh, some relate this to what provides the inner voice phenomenon that seems to be present in Chang'e and ayahuasca. Because Chang'e is a recent, where do we go, wait. Okay, sorry, lost my slides there. Let's stay there. Um, because Chang'e is a recent Western phenomenon, it really has no traditional ritual or customs. The development of self-styled rituals and ceremonial settings for smoking also reveals the adaptive and creative nature of psychonauts and their underground psychedelic networks. Graham St. John also pointed out the tensions between traditionalists and innovative adapters with a confluence of effects inherited from both the ayahuasca drink and smoked DMT. Chang'e is regarded as a hybrid pharmonostic phenomena. Its emergence then poses a challenge to advocates of either ayahuasca or DMT alone. So while Chang'e is indeed a relative of the two, it has forged a tradition of its own, and the trouble with calling it smokable ayahuasca lies in it really neither being DMT or ayahuasca. And given the absence of chacruna or chalaponga, which are the traditional DMT admixtures in South American ayahuasca, this could well be one point of contention. The insights we get from the way ayahuasca has entered the Western psyche can also be used to look at the emergence of Chang'e as an evolutionary strategy of the vine uh, for its survival, its growth, its development, and global healing. It's no surprise then the claim is made that Chang'e has changed, developed into something new and unique in its own right. 
Uh, Graham St. John also notes that Chang is one, but one among an assemblage of spiritual technologies or spiritechnics, championed by expressive expatriates, aggrieved by the disastrous effects of monotheism, possessive materialism, and ecological maladaptation. Get back. So, Chencho Dodge writes in that article, Nevertheless, it is said that Chang has become the next development, the next evolutionary step for the synergistic shamanic technology and entity we've come to know as ayahuasca, a unique synergistic hybridization of human and plant relationships, who most view as a feminine being that can be of great help to you in healing, learning, and personal growth. So this brings us to alchemy. Um... Alchem, the word we get our word chemistry from. So within the context of the alchemical vocabulary, the psychedelic experience as brought to us through plants long in the possession of Aboriginal people appears to be the identical phenomena as alchemy, as McKenna wrote. Parallels between psychedelics and alchemy have been well drawn, uh, notably by Terence McKenna, but also Ralph Metzner, Rick Strassman, Alan Watts, Gordon Wasson, Allegro, and many others. Because of the transformative role that DMT can play in a user's consciousness, the molecule, like other psychedelics, most notably the mushroom, has been speculatively compared with the mythical philosopher's stone. This may well be informed by the uh, aforementioned author's interest in Jungian archetypal psychology, pre-enlightened hermeticism, Kabbalistic and Gnostic philosophy, and so forth. Uh, Terence McKenna's analogies with alchemy and tryptamine consciousness can certainly have said to be catalyzed by their brothers, the McKenna brothers' famed experiment at La Charrera. Uh, this is where they sought to pair the sonic and psychic frequencies of the harmless from smoked ayahuasca vine leaf with the psilocybe cubensis mushroom, with the intent of making contact with some entity uh, or perhaps the transcendental object at the end of time that Terence felt we were being pulled by. Uh, Georgia Gaia, whose 2015 study into Chang'e's transformative qualities through self-reports, is the only real academic research on Chang'e to date. Uh, she also drew this connection between the unique qualities of Chang'e and alchemy. Um, back on. Yeah, so this alchemical process appears to be magic, for its nature is inexplicable, yet its results are sharp and clear-cut. Chang'e's alchemy transforms perceptions radically and quickly, and its transmutative effects can be felt across all the mysterious mechanisms of a user's inner consciousness. Chang'e's alchemy depends from nature as nature depends from our collective conscious evolution. And who is the alchemist then, if not a mirror of nature itself? In this light, Chang'e is depicted as the latest discovery of a magical creative tool for hyperdimensional explorations, opening a new interesting chapter in the journey of psychedelic awareness. Now, the late Ralph Metzner also wrote, there is a strong interest in purification and healing, and discovering or making a tincture or elixir that will give health and longevity. There is a recognition of the sacredness, the animating spirit of all matter, and there is an integrated worldview which sees spirituality, religion, health and illness, human beings, the natural world and its elements as all interrelated in a totality. So there are some key concepts here associated with alchemy that I would like to draw your attention to as I feel they give us a really good glimpse into the very psychedelic nature of this ancient practice and philosophy. So first we have the Philosopher's Stone. Everyone's heard of the Harry Potter movie? Uh, the principal goal of alchemy was and is the production of the Lapis Philosophorum, the Philosopher's Stone. Orthopedia Newman points out that in numerous alchemical texts, it is stated that this coveted stone is not made is sorry made not of stone, not of bone, not of metal, coming not from the mineral kingdom and not from the animal kingdom. He deduces that the true Philosopher's Stone is to be found only within the vegetable kingdom, as a crystalline drug prepared from entheogenic plants such as acacia. And he references the frequent significance placed on the acacia within Freemasonry, who are considered the alleged knowledge keepers of alchemy. So the prima materia, or the prime matter, theoretically to the alchemically inclined Freemasons, the stone was none other than DMT, a veritable vegetable stone, a purified crystalline stone or salt that has been extracted or to use alchemical terminology produced from the acacia tree. The stone is then dissolved into a red liqueur, which is afterwards imbibed by the candidate for initiation. Solvate a coagula. A term essentially to mean to break down and reform. Firstly, dissolving, breaking down, limiting parts of us that hold us back. The dissolution of one's ordinary, everyday sense of reality into a state of flux. 
and then a coagulation or reforming out of which identity is healed, renewed, and thus transformed. As chaos magician David Lee notes, this is a chemistry of mind and material, and arguably the most apparent philosophy in the practice and study of psychedelic efficacy. So key to all this is transmutation, as generally the Hermetic and Gnostic interpretations use the transmutation of lead into gold as a metaphor or analogy for the process of internal alchemy or transmutation of the soul or psyche. So transformation is the action of changing or the state of being changed into another form, which can also describe the unique phenomenological experiences of Chang'e, but also the synergy that as a substance to me equates to something more than the sum of its parts. It's more than just DMT and it's more than just the vine. They come together and there is something absolutely unique that is hard to pin as either one. So the elixir of life, the elixir of immortality. Uh, for one, the most likely psychoactive potion named Soma at the core of the Rig Veda traditions. Um, DMT explorers may well relate this notion, this concept of immortality, to experiences of timelessness and of a realm beyond this one in which the past, present and future coexist in a timeless stream of life beyond death or consciousness beyond death. As above, so below. Um, in a secular context, the phrase can refer to the idea that the microcosm reflects the macrocosm. We see this through atoms and solar systems, for example, or in a spiritual sense that earthly matters reflect the operation of forces on the etheric or astral plane. It also points to what we know about physiological, psychological and emotional health being connected to societal health. This is often experienced in the psychedelic state through the reflection of patterns, the resonance of fractal and dendritic networks at every level of mind and matter. So, most fascinating I find is the coincidentia oppositorum. The Chang'e experience is certainly a place of coinciding opposites, or of paradox, light and dark, pleasure and sorrow, love and fear, knowledge and uncertainty, chaos and order, familiarity and utter strangeness. As McKenna remarked, the alchemist had the wisdom to see that everything occurs in the presence of its opposite. It's done it's not either or, it's both and. The point of this union of opposites, as was done in alchemy, is to not force the system to closure, but to try and leave the system open enough so that the differences can resonate and become complementary to each other rather than antithetical. And he went on to say that it is only within this union of opposites that does not strive for closure that we are going to find cultural sanity. This brings us to the magnum opus, the great work. Um, the alchemical process that refers to both chemical and metaphysical transformations by creating an interrelationship between mind and matter and self and world. There are some unique alchemical analogies with Chang'e and Georgia Gaia even observed that the actual process of preparing and consuming the Chang'e mixture resembles alchemy. The neo-shaman being a creative alchemist whose task it is to search for the proper herbal synergy that can allow communication with the spiritual realm and precipitate a healing ritual. So to expand on this is something I've been observing for quite a while now. There appears to be a number of striking resonances and parallels with the alchemical steps of the great work and the DMT extraction process. We have calcination, which is a process of heating and decomposing raw matter or breaking it down. This would be the freeze thawing of the substance, the acacia or the mimosa. Second, we have dissolution, dissolving the ashes from this calcination stage in water or boiling the acacia or the mimosa in acidic solution. Thirdly is distillation, the boiling and condensation of the fermented solution to increase its purity. This could be also the reduction of the three boils of acacia into one. Then there's fermentation, a two-step process in which the unexpected mystic substance forms out of utter blackness as a yellow ferment, appearing like a golden wax. Now, through basification or raising the pH, this makes the solution black and acacia often yields a yellowish crystal or a goldy, wa golden waxy oil. Next comes separation, which is separating the substances to retrieve their basic constituents or essences. This would normally be our non-solvent pool. Uh, then conjunction, the recombination of the saved elements from separation into a new substance. This might be thought of as adding the collected solvent pools together or the combination of DNT and harmless. And finally, coagulation, which is the precipitation or sublimation of the purified ferment, our DMT crystal. Precipitation would be the evaporation of the solvent, 
and sublimation also refers, refers to the process of vaporizing. And these processes have a number of metaphysical denotations due to the significance of number seven, there being seven steps and chakras and uh, star signs and so forth. Psychedelic gnosis, the key to the Chang experience appears to be episodes of psychedelic gnosis, a subjective and experiential opening of the mind towards the inner knowledge of our divine nature beyond science and rationality. The term psychedelic gnosis in this context refers to any transformation of consciousness possible in individuals or social groups, with gnosis meaning knowledge, representing the liminal space created by ecstatic experiences induced by various techniques of shattering and reshaping identities. This type of knowing also functions as a kind of initiation or a revelation or a lifting of the veil of what lies beyond ordinary sensation. It's been described as an ecstatic reconnection with the unitary nature of being, a deeply subjective, experiential and salvational form of knowledge that is strictly personal, non-verifiable and incommunicable. A knowledge of the true nature of oneself and of the universe, which liberates the individual from domination as Walter Hanegraaff writes in his research. The types of psychedelic transformation referred to here may occur as an intimate acute experience or a form-shaking permanent alteration. It is a spectrum of effect that has incalculable personal and social consequences. So in her fieldwork, Georgia Gaia categorized the transformative qualities of Chang'e on three levels, personal, social, and spiritual. So to quickly summarize, the first was a personal transformation or an awakening quality where significant self-transformations influence how individuals perceive and interpret the external world and their wider society, including a reshaping of personal habits, lifestyles, and belief. Chang was seen as a therapeutic tool used to connect with the spirit world, to increase awareness and well-being, and to connect with the divine, giving greater sense of purpose and direction in life. Uh, the purpose being one step of a gradual process towards an elevated intuition and individual freedom. Yeah. Second, she noted a change in worldviews or a re-enchanting quality. Um, the focus on interpersonal transformation and social relationships, she describes these experiences giving us an opportunity to completely dissolve false beliefs of powerlessness, limitation and unworthiness, and describes this process as social deprogramming. Many report Chang'e as being like a teacher, and her subjects describe the development of new worldviews that made them more conscious of social issues, changing their way of living, and trying to positively influence friends and acquaintances as an initial step towards social improvement. And thirdly, a transformed understanding of the realm of the supernatural, or a guidance quality. Um, she states, although difficult to articulate, these experiences recurrently provoke deep personal reflection and a re-evaluation of the user's epistemological paradigm. Um, Chang users often affirm that the insights they gain from experiences they are used to get metaphysical and contingent guidance in everyday life. Um, it's been observed that Chang experiences are short-lived, but the time required for their interpretation and integration is consistently much longer. This often represents the starting point, though, of a bigger journey and the root of deeper subjective consciousness. Of course, personal interpretation is key when dealing with any entheogenic experience. And from this, two polarities seem to emerge. A disillusionment with the indulgences of contemporary Western society and an imaginative idealistic vision that can evolve a radical critical position towards mainstream society in general. Um, this, however, can also induce a sense of marginalization and estrangement uh, from family, friends, and others who simply can't relate. Uh, George Guy notes that the Chang interpretations are influenced by the cultural context in which the user is embedded, and at the same time, they're capable of mysteriously transcending individuals' prior cultural frameworks. Many have compared the DMT and ayahuasca awakening and other psychedelics to the red pill and the matrix. Um, and I'd love to go deeper into that, but there's some really great resources out there that I can point people towards later. There, so deconditioning and community. The theme of deconditioning or the function of unlearning learned behaviors is part of the shamanic process. And this process of cultural self-reprogramming as Georgia Guy described of Chang'e transformations, represents a type of liberation, both from over-determining cultural conditions and overweening social institutions. Through this cultural reprogramming, the Chang'e experience presents several potential challenges to existing power structures and the consequent social justice issues that arise around them. 
In his study of Australian ayahuasca drinkers, Alex Guerin noted that the theme of cultural critique is a significant one, with ayahuasca providing opportunities that heal distress related to interpersonal and social life, and then inform types of cultural critique related to urbanisation, materialism, consumer capitalism, and environmental destruction, alongside cultural ideas of a sustainable, sacred, and healthy planet and human species. Georgie Guy concluded that the conscious use of Chang'e might play a central role in human collective evolution. In the context of a larger social evolution, Chang'e is seen as a tool through which two main goals could be accomplished. Firstly, it would induce desirable levels of suspicion and uncertainty directed towards mainstream media and culture. Secondly, it would contribute to the re-enchantment of daily life, enhancing the belief that there is something more than what we can perceive with our five senses. So, we have a pretty good feel for what the self is. The various philosophical approaches show us that the concept itself is rather slippery. Um, who we are, such that we feel the same person through time and in different contexts. Or how we relate to the voice in our heads that we identify as the I. And the dialogue we have with that part that listens. Chris Letherby explored the notion that psychedelics respect authenticity in a unique way. By involving the person in a transformative process which is somewhat transparent, rational and meaning involved. DMT is so powerful and it unquestionably raises philosophical questions of self, the ontology of reality, and the hard problem of consciousness. But primarily, I think this could be reduced to what many refer to as ego death. Um, ego dissolution experiences reveal that the self model plays an important binding function in cognitive processing, but that the self does not exist. Is it then that those who experience a death of the self before death itself might become more selfless when it comes to others, finding a deeper purpose than merely self-help. Back. Uh, so McKenna, relating the self to society cultural ties back to the conjunctum oppositorum, we have a reconciliation of paradox, duality and unity. So how do we apply this perspective to cultural binaries in the sense that the personal is always political and we can come to see the ambiguity in life rather than socio-politically constructed dualities? So we may have challenges to establish hierarchies that set these dichotomies for us, such as self, other, us, them, male, female, right, wrong, good, evil. We may have challenges to identity, gender, race, and class, reshaping social imprinting and cultural narratives, and redefining markers of identity through countercultural nature and application of psychedelics. As Colin showed us earlier, the nurturing of plants can create a sense of home and belonging, through a meaning-making process of shared experience and the establishing of shared ideals and visions. Psychedelics can also give us more agency. Freed from conditioning, we see ourselves as having more power over what, we, over what happens to us than we may have previously been led to believe. That then leads us to feel more sovereignty, that psychedelics may enable us to see the sovereignty of our own beings as paramount, thus making it less acceptable for others to seek control over us. Is there such a thing as psychedelic values? Author of a book called Ayahuasca as a Social Change Agent, sorry, author of the book called Ayagoji, and his thesis was Ayahuasca as a Social Change Agent, Rowan Kaufman revealed that Ayahuasca has the potential to catalyze several antidotes to the values embedded in Western culture, of movement from Western hegemony towards self-determination, movement from individuality towards relationality, from anthropocentrism towards the natural world as sentient, away from consumerism and materialism, and from acceptance of these hegemonic institutions towards a critical criticality or rejection. Perhaps the most pressing concern, issue of concern and change in our society today is that of the environment. And my research from a few years ago found parallels with ayahuasca and the philosophy of deep ecology. The philosophy of deep ecology has in one sense become a perennial philosophy, representing the notion of direct experiential access to universal archetypal truths that transcend the boundaries of culture. It embodies a variety of traditions and embraces non-dualism, animism, pantheism, and holistic metaphysics. Psychedelic experiences can challenge our culturally constructed anthropocentric assumptions, separations, and illusory boundaries that arise from our society's values of self-interest, greed, waste, and exploitation. Such experiences help to undo these hierarchical binaries we come to know as human and non-human, self and other, spirit and matter, nature and culture, such that nature comes to be understood as a series of living subjects 
and not just as a range of utilitarian objects. Chang'e and other psychedelics can thus be just one lens and a range of tools through which we view ourselves as ecological beings. This helps us to understand that the dominant perception of our human species is somehow superior in the great chain of being is inherently flawed. So to the Gandhian quote, be the change that you wish to see in the world, is really a paraphrase of this. We but mirror the world. All the tendencies present in the outer world are to be found in the world of our body. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. This is the divine mystery supreme. A wonderful thing it is and the source of our happiness. We need not wait to see what others do. So here Gandhi is telling us that personal and social transformations go hand in hand. But clearly there is no suggestion in his words that personal transformation is enough. However, it replaces complaining about and blaming others through a reflection of our own actions. It stirs us into taking action with the only thing in the world we have control over, ourselves. So this Gandhi quote is about pulling others to take part in the change rather than pushing or coercing them. We notice this in the psychedelic experience when we stop resisting and we allow the experience to just take us. We're often then liberated from the inner tension within. This type of organisation has been called an ad hocracy or an organisational design whose flux structure is highly flexible, loosely coupled and amenable to frequent change. These processes actually unfold all the time but we are conditioned not to see them. Dominant power structures keep us from recognizing self-organization and self-leadership. The idea being that when we create shared meaning and higher purpose together, people self-organize and action happens. This is held together by individuals' integrity and authenticity, such that when people are unsure about the direction of change, a trust in our better nature and learning from each other inevitably allows higher order hierarchies to fall away, in theory. By changing yourself first, you become an example for others to follow, motivating them by your transformations and your example of how it could be, rather than motivating them through fear or intimidation of how things ought to be or must be. So this inevitably leads to a wide-eyed idealism. Inevitably, out of the psychedelic experience, emerges not despair, not self-indulgence, but wide-eyed idealism. That's the inevitable product of any psychedelically-driven social process. So a few afterthoughts here is that this is not for everyone. There are different modalities for different folks to achieve the same results from other methods, not necessarily psychedelics. Um, is, is there such thing as psychedelic privilege being embedded within mostly well-off uh, middle-class cultures? How do we use the power and access we have to psychedelics to lift others up? Through this, can we heal the sickness of Western capitalistic society? Is healing the sickness within the self just a metaphor for healing sickness in the world? After all, we are society, and how do we move beyond these existing and constraining modes of being that we're exposed to? There is an aim for the absence of divisive separation society, so how our internal world exists within the external world and how the external world exists within us is the key to an integral being or a wholeness of being or integrity. And the ability to envision new models of interaction is going to be key to move beyond mere critique towards actual construction of more egalitarian networks. Through an insight into the structure and mechanism of reality, and thereby the human spirit, do we wish to repeat the mistakes of the 1960s attitude of lamenting our dystopian present and doom future and claiming that only through the mass use of psychedelics can we be saved? Even though it must be said during that period, many great social justice movements came to prominence and indeed affected change. So I'd like to finally leave you with some quotes from Julian Palmer, the man who gave Changer its name and was instrumental in developing and spreading awareness of it. Uh, he wrote so much good stuff when I asked him to uh, make some points for this talk that yeah, I'll leave these with you.